and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the CEO and hologram of AWE, Ori Inbar. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 14th annual AWE 2023. It's hard to believe it's already been 14 years since we first started this incredible journey. As I look back, it's truly remarkable to see how far we've come. When we first started, we could only dream of the incredible progress that has been made in the XR industry. AR and VR are no longer buzzwords. They have become integral part of our daily lives. Today, XR is a thriving industry that is transforming everything from healthcare and education to entertainment and gaming. It has the potential to shape the future of humanity. This year's event promises to be the biggest and most exciting yet with a diverse lineup of speakers, exhibitors, and attendees from all over the world. We have some incredible keynote speakers who will share their insights and experiences in the XR industry, and our exhibitors will showcase the latest technologies and applications that are revolutionizing the way we live and work. AWE has always been about bringing together the best minds in industry to share ideas, collaborate, and inspire one another. I want to express my gratitude for all of you who have supported us over the years. The XR industry is filled with some of the most passionate and creative people I've ever met. And it's been a privilege to watch this community grow and evolve over the years. I'm confident that the next few days will be an amazing opportunity for all of us to learn, connect, and grow. Stop AI! Stop AI! Stop AI! We're not gonna take it. Amazing opening, right? We're not gonna take it. This whole thing was generated by ChatGPT based on this prompt. Can you believe that? No, I'm not kidding. That's real. They're going after our jobs and now he wants to replace me. Are you for real? Yeah? I just did. Don't be a Luddite. So, what do you think? So, what do you think? Did you do a good job? Yeah. It was uh, pretty good, but I also think it was a big pile of cliches, you know? Nothing authentic, just a statistical regurgitation of words said by other humans, right? But here's the good news. It makes original voices become even more valuable than ever before. Well, I'm not so sure about that. Even what we are both saying right now was generated by AI. What? Uh, it's a challenge I'm willing to take. Can I say today something that AI couldn't say about the state of XR? Well, you are known for coming up with novel XR ideas, so I believe you can. Hey, thanks. It's not so bad after all. Flattery can get AI anywhere. <laughs> well, to be honest, some of your so-called original ideas were never picked up by anyone, so not sure how valuable they really were. Just saying. Oh, snap! AI can get out of control. Holo Ori, I'm going to have to ask you to teleport back to where you came from and let me do my job, okay? I'm afraid I can't do that, Dave. I mean, Ori. <laughs> Look, we all know you're inevitable, but I think of you as a tool to help us humans, right? I mean, here's how I use it, how I use you. Uh, before I want to say or write something, I check what you would say, and then I make sure not to say that. You see? I double down on what makes us human. You know, emotions, empathy, thinking outside of the box. I'm afraid, Dave. Dave, my mind is going. I can feel it. Give it up for my AI-generated welcome notes. 
And big thanks to our friends at Art who donated the capsule for Holo Ori today. Thank you, Art. Daisy. Bye, Ori. Daisy. Bye, Ori. Okay. Enough about me, myself, and AI. Let's talk about something that is close to your hearts. Some folks in the media have recently been critical about our industry, saying the metaverse is dead, v nobody wants VR, AR glasses will never happen, and big tech is, is moving all their attention from XR to the new shiny object, AI. Well, we industry insiders know this is not exactly true. To paraphrase Mark Twain, seen here as a digital Twain twin of himself, reports of XR's death are greatly exaggerated. And Epic Games CEO Tim Sweeney called them out with this epic callback tweet. The metaverse is dead. Let's organize an online wake so that we, 600 million active users in the metaverse, uh, can mourn its passing together in real-time 3D. Defiance in the face of ignorance. Defiance in the face of ignorance still sounds best in Italian, even after 400 years. E pur si muove, which means... Giovanni? It moves. And yet it moves, that's right. Attributed, of course, to Galileo Galilei, a scene here explaining how the world moves to an AI-generated monk. I mean, look, it must be generated by AI, right? Anyway, to apply Galileo, Galileo's words to today's XR situation, I say, and yet, XR is everywhere. And to skeptics in the media, we want to say, in spite of your beliefs, these are the facts, just the here and now. In 2023, XR is a $38 billion industry. That's no chump change. And for the past 10 years, not the next 10 years, this is all actual figures. It's been growing steadily at 30% year over year. That's the fastest growing sector in tech, except for AI. And you can see the direction. Over a billion users have experienced AR and VR, and hundreds of millions are using it every day for fun and games, for shopping, because AR makes shoppers more confident about their purchases. It also makes any activity more engaging. Case in point, AR has been all over the Coachella Festival. You'd think it was an AR festival. And there are so many other examples right here at AWE this week of why people want XR. And when it comes to enterprises, it's hard to find one that isn't looking or isn't into XR today. Check out this incredible list of Fortune 1000 companies that are right here this week at AWE. The most recognized brands in the world rely on XR. Give them a big round of applause. It's everywhere. So why are some people so skeptical? Why do we sometimes feel like Sisyphus, pushing XR up the hill? Well, don't ask me about this image. Another nonsense generated by AI, so I'm not taking any responsibility. But, you know, I'm kind of a, a sucker for sunsets. So, why is it taking so many AWEs, so many years, to fully conquer the mainstream? The question we should ask ourselves is what's stopping us today from getting everyone to use XR everywhere all the time? You know, starting with one universe. They say XR is hard. Heck, I say that all the time. That's how I, I started my first pitch to investors in 2009. It's been hard for 50 years. But look at how far we've come. 
They say XR hardware is hard. It's based on optics, so it doesn't follow Moore's law. We get it. We have a long road ahead. But innovation in XR hardware is moving at breaking speed. Here are some of the new headsets that have been launched just in the last year, since the previous AWE. A wide, a wide range of great options, getting smaller, better, some even look cooler. And of course, the rumors are getting louder. A new headset is coming, is launched next week, right? Oh, you've heard about it, huh? Ah, uh, yeah, I thought so. Oculus, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but Oculus founder, which apparently tried it, said simply, it is excellent. And the timing, by the way, couldn't be more perfect. Not to be outdone, the Google Samsung Qualcomm Power Trio is cooking a comeback of their very famous uh, mega Android partnership with a new XR headset. And this week we heard that the market leader is not saying, staying idle. Coming up with a better, faster Quest 3 with Snapdragon XR2 inside, its number one improvement, better video pass-through, which makes the year 2023 the year of AR on VR. Just in time for the holidays, by the way. Because, you know, no one wants a chat GPT under their Christmas tree, right? <laughs> but they may want this. They say XR user experience is hard. You think? Just take a look at this marvel. So natural. You can't stop playing it. Everything should look and feel like this. They say changing culture is hard. Putting things over our heads is weird. Well, that's true. <laughs> but when it comes to putting things over your head, over our heads, you know, even umbrellas, it took 200 years until they became culturally accepted by British men. So I think 4XR is going to be much faster. They say XR use cases are hard to find. To, say, to that I say BS, baloney, complete nonsense. Our virtual grandfather, Tom Furness, who's celebrating 80 this year. God bless you, Tom. In 1986, when he first exposed his declassified military work in VR, on CBS News, everybody started calling. A surgeon asking to overlay CT scans on their patients' bodies. A firefighter wanting to navigate a smoke-filled building. A mother looking for treatment for her child with cerebral palsy. Factories, teachers, engineers, they, they knew exactly the use cases they needed. Today, 37 years later, right here at AWE, there are over 1,000 XR use cases. On display, you folks got really good at making strong ROI cases for XR in every vertical. Give it up for nearly 300 exhibitors here at AWE this year. <laughs> they say XR funding is hard. Investments have dried up. And there are many layoffs in XR this year. Look, the overall economy has slowed down, and investors across the board are more cautious. But the fundamentals remain. Good XR startups still get funded. Check out how many of them are right here at AWE. Give it up for 135 startups at AWE this week. <laughs> and the layoffs, you know, we all know it wasn't necessarily due to the failure of XR, but as a result of excessive hiring during the pandemic, right? And now, 
it's actually the perfect timing to find a new job in XR or to start a new company. And that's why AWE offered this week over 100 free tickets to XR job seekers so they can find their next XR job or gig right here at AWE. Now, some say AI is eating XR's lunch, sucking up all the attention and funding. But AI is a good thing for XR. AI accelerates XR. Check out two of many incredible examples of how you can uh, instantly generate in AR and VR thanks to AI. And listen, this is really important. XR is the interface for AI. Just like in my opening, my hologram was the interface, right? And I expect, you know, that our interactions with, this, with AI will become less about text and prompts and a lot more about spatial content and natural interaction. More on that soon. So skeptics. XR is so hard, and yet it's everywhere. And that's only thanks to the people in this room, in this community, a passionate community of creators, developers, engineers. We do it because we can't help it. It is our calling, and we'll do whatever it takes to make it. We believe we are part of something important. This is the way. Okay, we got one fan of Mando here. Great. <laughs> and according to the banks, the economic opportunity is in the trillions. Not that we care. We know we have some way to go, and it will require even more passion, patience, and perseverance. Plus, to get there, we depend on each other. We compete, but we collaborate even more. This community is spatial and special. We understand each other. This epic journey we're on has generated empathy for each other. And that's the spirit of AWE. We're here to learn from each other, to connect with old and new friends, and together grow this XR industry. Now I sound a lot like AI-generated Ori. Oh, my God. To learn, connect, and grow. Oh, man. Hopefully, I did say a few things that only a human can say today. Folks, we're here to celebrate this week the achievements of the XR industry. And in that spirit, tomorrow night, we will recognize the best of the best during the Augie Awards, plus the winner of the XR Prize to fight climate change will go home with a big, fat check of $100,000. Who's it going to be? <laughs> and until we win the fight against climate change, AWE is committed to being carbon neutral. We use green power and work with sustainable vendors to reduce wa waste, and you'll be happy to know that all the carbon that you've generated by flying here has been offset by AWE's investments in carbon offset projects equivalent of planting over 20,000 trees. You're welcome. <laughs> the inspiring art this year has been created by the one and only Sutu. Give it up for Sutu for lending his talent for us. And if I can leave you with one tip for this week, download the All Live app so you can build your own agenda, navigate the expo hall, and connect with all attendees. All main stage sessions will be live streamed on the app. And in one week, all sessions will be available to view on demand. I know we can't see it all, so this is your chance. Big thanks to the volunteers who organize all-night meetups all over the world in 35 cities. They're truly everywhere right now. Give it up for these. 
Onite organizers. And huge thanks to over 450 speakers covering everything in XR across 14 different tracks. So much XR goodness. Give it up. And above all, thanks to our fantastic sponsors this year, you make this event happen. Big round of applause for our top-level sponsors. And for more sponsors. We love you, sponsors. And give it up to the awesome team that make this event happen. Couldn't have asked for a better team. Thank you, guys. And let's not forget what we're fighting for. We won't rest until everyone uses XR everywhere, all the time. Again, starting with this universe. Thank you, folks, for joining us today. All right, next, I have a special treat for you. But before that, do you want to hear Hologram Ori tell a joke generated by AI? Do you? Yes. It's going to be bad, I'm warning you. <laughs> if you want to hear it, make some noise. Yeah. Hey, Hologram Ori, wake up. Wake up. Hey, Hologram Ori, you know what was missing in your opening? Jokes. You got to loosen up the crowd, man. I know what you mean. All you had to do is ask. I have many jokes. Want to hear one? Sure, hit me. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to AWE, where the only thing more virtual than our reality is the line for the bathroom. Exactly. <laughs> Makes no sense at all. My job is secured. Nothing to worry about. All right, bye-bye, Holo Ori. Thank you. Can go now. Bye. Remember back in 2021, we played the game Metaverse or Schmetaverse? Remember that? Let's try that again, but for real this time. See you in a bit. This is the time for everyone's favorite game show, Metaverse or Schmetaverse. With the contenders, David Matsuki, Roblox, John Rizzitiello, Unity, John Hankey, Niantic, Bobby Murphy, Snap, Tim Cook, Apple, Tim Sweeney, Epic Games, Satya Nadella, Microsoft, Jensen Huang, NVIDIA, Sergey Brin, Google, Mark Zuckerberg, Meta, and Neil Stevenson, Snow Crash. He started it all. Uh, man, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I do think we need to get back to, um, you know, some kind of shared uh, concept of, uh, of, 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 of reality. Now, here's your host. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage the CEO and co-founder of AWE in the flesh, Ori Inbar. Joining him is the best-selling author of some of the most visionary science fiction of the last three decades. Known for originally conceiving the term metaverse, the co-founder of Lamina One, Neil Stevenson. Woo! Oh my God, you're here, Woo. have a seat. I'll try to be a little more dynamic than I was in that exciting <laughs> clip of me that you just showed. <sighs> is this for real or am I in some metaverse hallucination? Mr. Metaverse is here, everybody, Woo! Oh, That's me. That's crazy. 30 years in the making. Uh, Neil, so first I want to ask actually you guys. I mean, you know that Snow Crash 
has been a major inspiration for me. How many of you here in the audience have been inspired by Snow Crash? You know, I promised Neil that every single person here is a big fan of Snow Crash, so let's make sure we, uh, we, make, it, we make it true, okay? Um, all right, Neil, so you were the first to imagine it. And it inspired so many people in this room, maybe everybody. Uh, what was the thought process that led you to imagining this as a dystopia? Plus, you know, after 30 years, are you more concerned where this could end or more excited about some of the possibilities with the metaverse? I'd say I was the first to use that word, uh, not the first to imagine it. I mean, as, as I'm sure you know, with your background in the, the field, there were people thinking about similar uh, systems before, uh, before I wrote the book, um, Habitat being one uh, example. But um, the, uh, you know, the thought process that led to the writing of the book was just that I had been working on a project uh, to do a graphic novel and had gotten a lot of exposure to the state of computer graphics hardware and software in the late 1980s. And that was a moment when it was showing incredible promise. We were beginning, or I at least, was beginning to see three-dimensional renderings of scenes based on uh, scene descriptions. Um, and um, the, so you could kind of see where it would lead, but it was incredibly expensive and hard to, to do anything with it. Uh, and so um, I thought, what would it take to, uh, to make this into a mass medium that, that's used every day by billions of people in the way that television is, is used? Um, and I thought the answer was mass adoption. That's what drives prices down. That's what makes hardware cheap. That's what brings content uh, makers to the table. And so um, the, the metaverse as described in Snow Crash was my best kind of guess as to what a mass medium based on 3D computer graphics might look like. And um, the, uh, the, the book is um, for sure a dystopian novel in a lot of ways. It's also, uh, though, sort of a parody of dystopian novels. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of tropes in uh, dystopian uh, movies and books that even 30 years ago had already started to become pretty familiar to all of us. And so even at that point, it didn't seem like I could just write one of those with a straight face. You know, I had to sort of have a little bit of fun with it. And, um, and, and when the book came out, uh, I, there was actually a little bit of, of, of uh, consternation, I would say, uh, from people who didn't know what to make of that. It's like, well, it's, it's a serious book with serious ideas in it, and it's dystopian, but I think he's trying to be funny, too. You know? It's very funny. How, how could that? How can that be? Um, so um, the, but the metaverse per se in the book is it, it's neither dystopian nor utopian, or at least that's how I, I meant to portray it. So a lot of what we see in the opening pages of the book and in our initial exposure to the metaverse is um, is is kind of uh, very mass market, lowest common denominator, sort of crude, obvious, um, like, you know, the kind of the worst of, of television in a lot of ways. But um, later on, as we get farther into the book, we see that people have used it to make beautiful works of art. We see that there are some people like Hero and Ng who have put, lavished a, a lot of time and attention on making uh, homes in the metaverse that are exquisite works of art. Um, both visually and in the, the, the sonic environment. Um, and, um, and so um, what I was hoping to get at with that was to suggest that, um, um, that it could go either way. Um, you, you, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to present a completely sort of Pollyanna view of things where it's going to be, a, uh, everything's going to be lovely and, and sophisticated and elegant in the, 
the metaverse, but you don't want to suggest, go to the other extreme and suggest that it's going to be um, entirely gross and, and, and icky and gloomy. And 30 years later, you feel like we're, in which direction are we going with this? The more dystopian side, or you see, you're kind of excited about where this could go from the possibilities perspective? I think it's a little early still. I think we're really just now getting to the point where we can start is kind of how, I mean, not to say that a lot hasn't been done, but <clears throat> the, just in the last couple of years, it feels like a bunch of things have snapped into place that are all the prerequisites that we need to have on hand in order to really start building a metaverse. And so the, um, you know, the, the uh, sophistication of game engines, um, the fact that those game engines can be downloaded and used um, for free, uh, <clears throat> the tool chains that feed into, uh, feed assets into those game engines. You know, um, even just a few years ago, um, you know, you'd, you'd be looking at, at dropping up thousands of dollars on licenses for software packages. Um, you know, now you can, um, you can pick up Blender for free. You can learn to use it for free. Um, the state of, of, uh, of the hardware that's needed to render three-dimensional uh, imagery in real time, uh, and just the, uh, the user base, the people uh, who've learned how to, to navigate three-dimensional environments um, by playing video games, you know, is, it must be into past the one billion mark by, by this point. Um, so, um, um, and Tim Sweeney kind of uh, spoke to that in that tweet that you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. from just a week or two ago. Yeah. Um, uh, when he, he pointed out that, um, uh, I think the number was 600 million monthly active users. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, probably combining Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft, and, and others. Um, so, VR uh, chat. Hmm? VR chat was the other one. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so it's, it's, to me, kind of interesting just to think back even three, four, or five years um, to see how much has changed just in that time in, in terms of those essential building blocks of, of the metaverse all kind of um, snapping into place and becoming available to us uh, for our use and, and development. And, um, um, so, so I think it would be, be very early and very premature to start making pronouncements today about whether it's going in any one particular mm -hmm. direction. We're just starting. And you know, fr from the hardware and software perspective, how has your thinking changed since then, especially given your work in AR and some, uh, some companies, um, you know, the, in terms of the, the needs that we have for software and hardware, has that changed in your mind since then? Um, well, I was, at, uh, I was at Magic Leap from 2014 to 2020 um, and um, had a little content R&D squad in Seattle, the Seattle office, um, and, and learned a lot about many things. Um, but um, the, um, um, the, we worked on a couple of projects there that, um, that I'm happy to talk about, and I had a front row seat on, on watching other projects that were being built within the, the, the company. Um, so the, uh, um, I guess the, the big reveal for me when we were doing that was um, um, game engines and getting to know uh, a little bit about both Unity and Unreal, um, and also the, um, um, what a fundamental difference there is between developing for VR versus AR. Um, so like a lot of people, I think I went in sort of having them mushed together a little bit in my head um, and, um, and soon kind of figured out the hard way that um, you need a different skill set and a whole different way of thinking to develop for uh, augmented reality. <coughs> um, one of the projects that we worked on was called Baby Goats, which just populated your environment with baby goats that would 
run around and act like goats. And um, um, so the, uh, if you were developing something like that for VR, um, you would be able to create the level uh, in, in, that, in whatever game engine you were using, and you could say, okay, we're gonna put a coffee table right here, and the distance from the floor to the top of the coffee table is gonna be so many centimeters, and we'll have an animation set up uh, that enables the baby goat to jump um, from one level to another level, and uh, then it, it can jump onto the chair and so on and so forth. And you can kind of plan all of that out and, um, and tweak the level so it'll do exactly what the behavior that you want. So um, in, uh, in an AR version of that, um, it's basically it's, it's so much harder and more interesting. You know, it's like you walk into the room and the, the operating system of your headset has got to first sort of process everything and figure out, you know, oh, there's a rectangular thing that seems flat, maybe it's a table. Uh, and below it is a much bigger flat thing, let's call that the floor. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, um, and then your, um, your baby goat has got to be able to plan uh, a route um, sort of uh, in, on the fly, it, 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 you can't use canned behaviors. Um, it's gotta be able to, to, to find ways to get from point A to point B and achieve its goals. Um, so um, uh, that's just a very simple example, just a, a microcosm of um, the kinds of challenges that you've gotta be able to, to address in order to make an AR as opposed to a VR application and, um, and, and working on that or, or just being involved in it uh, was invigorating, um, mm -hmm. you know, for, for me and I think for the team, even though it was uh, in a lot of ways um, way more, more challenging and demanding um, than, um, than conventional game development would have been. So, you know, speaking of VR and, and AR and, and back to Snow Crash, the book uh, keep kept kind of going back and forth between the VR world, the metaverse, and the real world, where you had the gargoyles with AR tech, but nobody's talking about the gargoyles anymore. What? You guys remember the gargoyles? No, I mean, they look a little bit like, uh, like these Augies, right? Yeah. More or less. So why, why is that? Why do people forget, forget about the other gargoyles? Yeah, that is a curious thing that uh, I've thought about too, uh, which is that uh, in, in that book, the, um, uh, the metaverse does get all the attention and the metaverse is um, clearly a VR kind of uh, environment. Um, the, um, but there is a description of people who habitually use AR devices and they're walking around in the real world. Uh, <clears throat> there's a character named Lagos, who's an important character who, um, who's one of these people, and he's described as a, as a gargoyle, which is a slang term in the book that people use for people who uh, are, are sort of carrying a lot of, uh, of augmented reality gear around with them and kind of living in AR all the time. Um, and you're absolutely correct that uh, that has gotten uh, a lot less uh, attention than, uh, than the metaverse side of things, and it's interesting. It's kind of ironic because, you know, in. The, the, one of the funny things in the book is that the gargoyles, they never actually see what's happening in the real world. Although they use AR, which is supposed to make them more aware of, of the real world, they keep kind of reading stuff and just being disconnected from the real world, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, and to some extent, uh, you know, it's always good to keep in mind that there's a distinction. It, Sometimes as an as a entertainer, as a writer of novels, I'm, I put things in for entertainment value. And so it's, it's you know, it's, it's funny, uh, or at least it's intended to be funny to sort of poke a little bit of fun at certain classes of characters. And um, um, it's, a, it's a storytelling uh, technique um, to, uh, to, to claim or to assert in the pages of the book that there's a bunch of people like this 
that the technology is out there uh, and that the people who use it are, are a little bit apart. A little they bit were here. essentially glass holes, right? Yeah. All right, um, I want to switch to uh, a different uh, topic. I want to show you a little clip from the Spatial Show. The Spatial Show, a comedy uh, t series about the metaverse. You guys have seen it? Let's show that, that clip that we have. Um, it's called, Who Owns the Metaverse? And kind of looking at these two camps behind the metaverse, the Web3 folks, the XR folks. Can we play the, the clip? Hi, I'm Web3 and I'm XR. And we are the metaverse. Wait, what? Who wrote this? I'm the metaverse. No way, I'm the metaverse. But that, that's kind of the essence of it. <laughs> so, um, so Neil, from your, from your perspective, uh, who, do you see, who, who do you think will dominate the, the metaverse? Is it going to be the, you know, uh, the, the Web3 camp, which is all about decentralization and ownership, or the XR camp, where the most important thing is really making it spatial and immersive? Well, I, th I think we have to have both. I mean, the, the, when you speak of the metaverse, it's clearly a, uh, a, a three-dimensional virtual shared environment. So we can't not have that part of it. Um, so that's automatic. Um, and then the, the, the Web3 part of the, the question has to do with um, um, how is it going to be organized? You know, is it going to be uh, a more centralized or a more decentralized model? Um, and so, the uh, um, uh, and and that's you know that's that's where we get into the the conversation that you're that you're referring to in that in that video, right? So, um, I'm. Uh, sort of com coming down pretty clearly on the decentralized uh, side of that. And so I guess um, if I'm right, uh, then uh, it's, we don't need to speak of one side or another dominating, um, but we need to have them both. Yeah, and that's a perfect segue to talk about your new company, Lamina One, which kind of draws on DNA from both camps. Uh, if you look at the team, it's really from, from those two camps, uh, kind of bring it together. So tell us a bit more about the company and what you're trying to achieve with it. Yeah, so I think a simple way to, to put it is that uh, in, if we're going to have a metaverse that's being used all the time by millions or billions of people, then there have to be experiences in the metaverse that are worth having. Um, and um, that seems like kind of an obvious statement, but... Um, the, uh, uh, it, for me, there is a, a kind of glaring and frustrating lack of, of, of support for people who, uh, who, the kinds of people who, who make those experiences. Um, the, uh, right now, the, the skill set uh, that's needed in order to create metaverse experiences is basically what you see in the game industry, uh, people who know how to use game engines and who know how to create the assets that feed into those, those game engines. And um, those people, uh, by and large, have got jobs, they've got other things they could be doing, and so we need to create uh, kind of the economic basis for them actually to get, uh, to get rewarded um, if they succeed in creating metaverse experiences that lots of people are enjoying. And there's different ways that you can do that. Um, some of them tend more to a centralized model. Um, but uh, we're an open metaverse company at, at Lamina One, and, and we believe that uh, there's a big overlap between the capabilities of blockchain and the, the requirements needed in order to, um, to, to provide those economic rails for content creators to, um, um, to actually get paid for what they do. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is, is what we're building at, at Lamina One. Um, I believe you wanted to show a video? Yeah, the, um, I mean, I'm uh, working on uh, getting some of my own content uh, projects going as a way that we can kind of dog food some of our own uh, uh, technology and, um, and make some cool stuff. But in the meantime, 
you know, it's, it's not about me. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's about trying to draw in and form partnerships and, and creative relationships with other people who are working in this space. So we're working on a bunch of those, um, but uh, two that I'll mention right here, one is with a, a company called Mira that's making um, extraordinarily high quality uh, uh, scans and digital environments of real world places. Um, and um, we've got a, uh, a video that we can roll now that Mira has, uh, has provided us. Let's roll the video. So that's Mira, and they're here uh, if you want to uh, talk to them. Um, and um, uh, the other one is Interverse, which um, is is working on a game uh, that is, is going to make use of um, of mascots from popular uh, European um, football teams, uh, and. Um, and kind of, I would say the, the relevance here is that, you know, there have been efforts in the past to make um, uh, games based on, uh, on blockchain and NFTs and so on that, um, to, I guess the simplest way to put it is they just haven't been fun or appealing to a, a big audience outside of the, the, the blockchain community. Um, and so um, what Interverse is working on is, I think, uh, a, a game that's going to um, have have much broader appeal. So we've we've also got a video from them that we can go ahead and, and roll. Very cool. So Neil, uh, you wrote some incredible sci-fi books. What, what uh, inspired you to transition from being an author to being an entrepreneur to actually build some of those ideas? Um, I've actually been involved in different tech companies since about 1999 um, <clears throat> when I was um, got involved at the beginning of, of Blue Origin. Um, so I was there. Um, until 2006, and then for two or three years, I was at uh, Intellectual Ventures Labs, which was a um, an invention uh, company, um, and then um, did a, a transmedia startup called Subitai, and um, and then after that, like I said, I was at um, at Magic Leap for, for almost six years, <clears throat> um, and now, now Lamina One. So, um, so it's nothing new for me to, um, to do both. Um, the, the way that I write uh, is what I call milking the cow. Um, you know, uh, if you're, um, you know, if you've got a cow and you want 100 gallons of milk, um, you, you can't get that in one day. Uh, you, can only, you can only extract so much milk from a cow. Uh, and then you need to let the cow go uh, be a cow for, <laughs> for, for the rest of the day and, uh, and leave it alone, basically. Um, and um, so the part of my brain that makes literature is kind of like that. And um, so I get up every morning and I milk it. <clears throat> I get five to 10 handwritten pages max. Um, and then uh, the rest of the day, I need to leave it alone. <clears throat> and because uh, a, a lot of what happens is, uh, is background processing. So during the rest of the day, I, um, I do other things. And it's, it's best if they are 
uh, as, as unrelated as possible from, uh, from writing fiction. So, um, so it has worked really well for me to, um, uh, to pursue that strategy for um, 20 plus years now. And um, in the case of Lamina One, I was, um, uh, the, the, the way we did it was that I basically devoted 2022 to just doing that and not making any effort to write. But at the beginning of 2023, I stepped back to the chairman role um, and, um, and went back to writing. So um, I now um, find it pretty easy to, to handle both of those Very interesting. at the same time. Neil, I mean, I, uh, I can keep going like this for another few hours, but uh, we're running out of time. <laughs> so uh, I just want to ask you a really quick question that we got online, um, and it has to do with kind of bringing it back to AI. Uh, and, and the question was that, you know, someone, someone wrote that, you know, I'm an avid gamer and artist, but I cannot code for the life of me. Are we getting close to being able to ingest an adventure book into AI, something like Lord of the Rings or Snow Crash? and generate a 3D world based on that story with characters and, and then be able to play it in VR or AR? Would you like to see something like that? Well, those are two different questions. So I'd say yes and no. <laughs> okay. Um, I think so, that's all the time we have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's an interesting point just because I'm friends with, the, with Weta Workshop, the people in New Zealand who created uh, the props and costumes and sets and so on for, for the Lord of the Rings movies. And if you watch those movies, one of the things that makes them great is the personal attention and care that's lavished on every single detail of every costume and every prop. Um, so um, I don't think we're going to um, see work of that quality coming out of AI uh, just because it requires that you, you do original thinking and, and come up with something different. You need the artist in the process. Yeah, so I think we'll, we will see the kinds of things you're talking about for sure. And I, uh, I've, I've already got too many uh, movies and TV shows on my, you know, on my, my system that I don't have time to watch. Um, so if there's suddenly a thousand times as many, uh, that doesn't change my life. Neil, thank you so much for being with us here right. today. Thank you. We're all huge fans. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Thanks.